Welcome to our education research series. I'm Dr. Sheila Segerson, the Director of Community Solutions at Maddie's Fund. Maddie's insights are practical tips based on current research to help pets and people and that you can use in your shelter. I'm really excited about this research today because we've been using treat buckets in shelters for over 20 years, and yet there's still very little research about them. Today, we have two guests who will share their work with treat buckets, studying excessive barking in kennel dogs. Their work resulted in data that shows that applying a basic learning theory could change the emotional state of dogs from negative to more positive and reduce the fear and frustration that often leads to excessive barking. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Bennett, who I've known for quite a while and am so happy to hear have here with us today. Dr. Bennett is a board certified veterinary behaviorist with lots of experience working with shelters and is a clinical assistant professor and veterinary behavior specialist in the Department of Clinical Sciences at North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Bennett particularly enjoys addressing problem behaviors in sheltered and rescued animals through clinical practice and research. Her aim is to protect animal welfare, make the sheltering experience less stressful, strengthen the human-animal bond, and increase the likelihood that pets' new homes will become their forever homes. Dr. Bennett is joined by a rising star, Jamie Carrero, a third-year veterinary student at North Carolina State University. Jamie was born and raised in Puerto Rico and has a bachelor's degree in animal science from the University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez. I probably pronounced that incorrectly. How, how do I pronounce that, Jamie? It's Mayaguez. Mayaguez campus. Yes. Let's welcome Dr. Bennett and Jamie to learn more. Hi. Thank you so much for having us for this. We're actually very excited. This has been some pretty interesting research that we've been working on that had a little bit of a COVID roadblock, but we got back into it. Um, so to get started here, uh, a little bit about us. Uh, Dr. Sigerson already introduced who we are uh, a little bit, but just so you can put a name with a face. Uh, I'm on the left with my lovely horse, and Jamie is on the right with her guinea pig friend. And... Um, we are gonna go ahead and jump right into the introduction. So why do, we, why do we do this study? Why do we care? Well, the biggest question is uh, excessive barking from tail dogs is a major welfare concern, uh, whether it be in shelters or uh, any other type of kennel situation. Uh, we can have uh, hearing loss occur in humans and in dogs. Uh, a single bark from a dog can produce sounds up above 100 decibels and these can be sustained for quite a long period of time, especially when we have multiple dogs who are barking. Uh, exposure to excessive barking can result in hearing loss, as I mentioned, for both people and dogs. And OSHA actually requires people to wear hearing protection if the decibels reach over 85 um, decibels um, for a period of time. Dogs actually have a threshold of sensitivity for hearing 24 decibels lower than what people do. And so when they're actually at even higher risk, for hearing damage uh, and uh, loss in loud environments than we people are. Additionally to that, exposure to loud noises for a period of time can also have uh, behavioral and psychological effects. Uh, there have been a few studies that have looked at this specifically. Uh, Scheifel and colleagues found that dogs that displayed uh, stress signs such as paw lifting, uh, lower body postures, cowering, uh, and snout licking, indicative of increased stress when they are exposed to louder noises. And of course, excessive barking is an undesirable characteristic for a lot of potential adopters. And really loud words actually cause people to hurry through them and not linger uh, to interact and meet with those dogs. And so some dogs, especially in those louder words, can actually get overlooked. So um, aside from just being obnoxious to people um, and having physical hearing loss as a direct consequence, we can also have the chronic stress secondary to that uh, cause our animals to be increased susceptible to um, medical illnesses such as upper respiratory problems. And this doesn't just go for dogs, it goes for anybody who's within hearing range of dogs. Additionally, we want to think about um, why are the dogs in the shelter barking? Um, oftentimes it's from fear and frustration. These are negative emotional states. 
Um, they can be a consequence of social isolation. Um, they're in a kennel oftentimes by themselves. Um, they're motivated to interact with people or other dogs, and they can't. Um, or they're frightened. They're frightened of strangers. They're frightened of the unfamiliar dogs. Uh, or they're frightened of other noises, loud clanging and banging, or the other barking noises happening. Sometimes, if they're in that space long enough, we can actually also uh, see territorial behaviors that are demonstrated. And this just compounds the problem of trying to um, say how they feel about the situation, which also causes increased noise and increased barking on the other side of this as well. So, so why do we care? Well, we care because we've been doing this for quite a long time, as Dr. Sigerson said, but there's actually not been a whole lot of research looking into it. Uh, there's a lot, not a lot of research looking into anything, but there are some that have looked into other options, um, usually physical uh, ways to try to reduce shelters, uh, noise in shelters, but some of these can be actually quite challenging. Uh, additionally, we've discussed some of the welfare concerns already, um, but it, as I said, it also negatively impacts everybody within earshot. Think about the cats who are next door, uh, even with that door shut. Can you still hear barking in there, even quietly? If you can, your cat sure can. Uh, where are your small mammals or your birds housed? And then, of course, the staff and volunteers, we can get a lot of um, compassion fatigue uh, from the people exposed to that really stressful loud noise all the time as well. So moving into a little bit of the behavioral science that we need for the background of what we're going to do, how this is going to work, I want to talk a little bit, very briefly, about um, classical conditioning and operant conditioning. And hopefully you can see our little graphic on the side there. Classical conditioning is Pavlov. Uh, Pavlov's dogs drooling when he rang the bell, um, anticipating the food or meat powder being brought in. We're making an association, an involuntary association, with something that's happening in the environment. Whereas with operant conditioning, this is called response dependent versus response independent. Uh, this is where you think about the scanner boxes, right? The little rats pressing the lever uh, to get a food treat to be delivered. So they're operating on the environment, trial and error, if you will. So the quiet kennel exercise that we are was the basis of our experiment. This is a response independent pairing. This is classical conditioning, this is Pavlovian conditioning. Um, and what we're trying to do here is change the negative emotional state, which is what we discussed, which resulting in barking, fear or frustration, to a more positive state with something that's inherently pleasant to the dog. So specifically what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the fear of frustration that is caused by people passing by, whether, um, whether they want to greet or they're afraid of them, and if we pair it with food, now we make the people coming by more positive or pleasantly associated to the dog. And therefore, we reduce the behavior that was motivated out of that negative emotional state that we want to adjust. So thinking about some things that have been tried before, I want to make sure that uh, everybody's got an idea of what we've done before, what has worked and what hasn't, and where our, our pros and cons are. Uh, structural changes, uh, that has been investigated uh, in terms of what is uh, an option for shelters. Uh, is it economically viable? Not really for a lot of organizations. It costs a lot to put sound dampening panels in, changing the uh, structure of the kennels, what the material is made of. We don't really know if it changes the emotional state of the dogs because we haven't really looked. Does it really give people and dogs the opportunity to have positive interactions with each other? Because it's just a static change in the environment. Is it simple to implement? Usually structural changes within the shelter are never simple to implement. Um, but once it's in place, there is no extra work needed from the staff and volunteers because it's there. When we think about enrichment, so adding things to the dog's environment to try to help make them have a better emotional state, better emotional welfare, it can be economically viable. We can do it fairly inexpensively in a lot of cases. It can change the emotional state of the dogs, does give us an opportunity for positive interactions. But sometimes it's not so simple to implement. It takes a little bit of training uh, or extra work from our staff and volunteers to put that into place. Some have looked at limiting volunteers. Uh, we know that if there is an increase in foot traffic through the shelter, barking is going to increase. 
makes sense. We can limit it. Sometimes we limit it for certain times. I've worked with some shelters who wanted to limit it and have people look online only. Um, economically viable? Yeah, perhaps. Doesn't cost anything really to not have people come to the building. Uh, we don't know if it changes the dog's emotional state to a more pleasant one if they are not there because we didn't look at the other side of that. Um, doesn't really give opportunity for positive interactions if there's no people there, but it's simple to implement. And once it's in place, it doesn't take much work. With a quiet channel exercise, this is where we can hit uh, check boxes in each of our areas. Easy and inexpensive, changes the emotional state, gives us a positive interaction, it's simple to do, and it's really very little work um, in place for our staff and volunteers. So um, we have done a small pilot study of this uh, to start with at NC State just before COVID came in. Uh, we actually used one of the boarding kennels here at the Health and Wellness Center of the vet school. And um, the dogs that were um, participating were owned by faculty, staff, or students who board their dogs during their long work days here at the uh, teaching hospital. Uh, it was a smaller population. It was a less diverse population because we had the same dogs uh, in general coming in more frequently. But even with this being a pretty small study, we did have some really interesting promising results with our volume decreasing over time uh, and the interest and participation of the people who, who happened to walk through the wards also improving over time. So this is where we kind of took the next step and started to put this project into place. So yeah, and this is where I come in on the summer of 2022. I joined the program with Dr. Bennett with the Veterinary Scholars Program. Um, and because we had seen such positive results with the pilot study, we wanted to implement it in a bigger setting that was like more realistic of what we see in shelters. And so with that, our aim was to demonstrate that by implementing a simple counter conditioning exercise, we could help change the emotional state of dogs and reduce the fear and frustration that leads to excessive barking in the presence of people. At the same thing with the pilot study, we hypothesized that the volume of barking in decibels will, will decrease after four weeks of intervention with the quiet kennel exercise. So essentially, we expected the same, but with a much larger population. And so our study took place at the Wake County Animal Center here in Raleigh, North Carolina. It is a very big shelter that has five wards of adoptable dogs and with over 120 kennels um, at its maximum capacity. There were like more than 120 dogs there. Um, and yeah, so uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, so the shelter had this very specific way of organizing the dogs. They try to be in intentional about sound and where they would place the dogs. The bigger ward was the one you see on the picture on the bottom. It's a very big room that had like um, dogs in, in every corner had two uh, sort of aisles and dogs could see each other from across their kennels. The first, the picture we have over there first uh, is a smaller ward. Uh, it, it's only one aisle and here in wards like this, the staff members would place the dogs that were naturally quieter or maybe shyer. So they would try to keep the noise level to a minimum in, in this um, rooms. However, um, the population was constantly changing and when the shelter was getting progressively full throughout the summer, it was hard to keep track of, of the quieter ward versus not. And so as it happens in a shelter, the population it was very, very uh, varied. Um, we had different breeds, dogs of different sizes, ages, intact or fixed, since the sh this shelter normally waits for the dogs to be, <clears throat> sorry, for the dogs to be um, adopted before they, they uh, are neutered or spayed. They were like a very uh, varied population there in terms of how they were physically. Um, majority of the dogs were singly housed, except for the dogs that were bonded pairs or that um, are li big leaders of puppies that would typically stay together. As I said before, four of the five wards had visual barriers meaning that the dogs couldn't see each other from across the room. They could, in fact, hear each other though. And it was a constantly changing population as the dogs would get adopted um, or go into foster, or maybe if they had presenting any signs of illness that were removed from the study. It's important to know that all the dogs that participated in the study were deemed um, ready for adoption by this shelter, or at least they were in a straight hold, meaning that they were waiting for the owners to show up. 
Um, the dogs have received like a, a minimum medical exam and behavior assessment before they were placed here. So they were uh, certified to um, tolerate people and, and be ready for adoption if they were adopted. When the study started, we did the noise measurements using a decibel reader. And this decibel, which is the picture that you see right there, is actually the one we use, um, gathered the sound and gave us an average of the sound in each second. We were measure kind of like the barks can get the higher number from that. Um, we did the readings from Monday to Friday in the morning and midday and in the afternoon. And each reading lasted about 30 seconds. For each day, I would... Um, go into each room and st stand on the same side so the measurements will be all from the same place. So <clears throat> the quiet killer exercise uh, was divided into two phases. The first one was the ba baseline, which was two weeks long. In here, we would let the people pass as they normally would, meaning they were not aware that we, we had a study going on. And I would just go in to measure the sound three times a day. During the intervention, period, it lasted four weeks. Um, and in this part, we place buckets with treats in each kennel and you sign as the one you see here on the picture that we will place almost on every kennel. That And this encouraged the people that pass by to toss a treat to each dog. Um, the signs were very simple, sort of like to minimize the <laughs> reading, but also in the entrance of every word, we had a more detailed paper, a sign that said kind of like the study and what we were trying to do. And so aside from the sound, we also measured compliance. We place a camera in each ward. And during the baseline period, I would only count the people that would come in through the ward, the visitors, the staff members, and just count how many times they would pass throughout the room. During the intervention period, um, we started to count if they would give treats or not, and we would classify them as compliant or non-compliant. And with this, I'm going to move. Dr. Ben is going to explain how we got our results. Yes. You move into our statistical analysis. Uh, so we uh, used uh, JUMP software uh, to evaluate our data. We did summary statistics to start with, descriptive statistics, um, looking for outliers. We're looking for things like the mean, the median, the minimum, the maximum uh, volumes that we uh, collected at each measurement period in each day. Uh, we also looked at the number of people who pass through. So those were called passers through and also the percent compliance with that. Um, and additionally, uh, we did a linear mixed model uh, to try to look at a couple of different treatment variables. First off, we wanted to compare baseline to intervention and see what the differences were between those and see if they were statistically significant. Um, upon looking that a little bit closer, we also wanted to look at whether the number of dogs in the ward was significant. Um, it, Spoiler alert, it wasn't. So we ended up having our unit of measurement actually being the rooms rather than the number of dogs. But we also wanted to look at compliance. So whether or not um, the people were actually participating in the study, did that have an impact on the volume that was being measured? Um, so we did a couple of other additional tests um, to make sure that everything um, uh, was matching and we had uh, relationships where they needed to be. But uh, if you want more details about that, feel free to ask, uh, or you can also read the study that we will be uh, submitting for publication, um, hopefully by the end of this month. So, so thinking about who participated, uh, Participation, interestingly enough, actually consisted almost entirely of members of the public. Um, some volunteers and staff members would participate uh, but some also did not, or they were inconsistent about it. Um, however, there were some staff members that were so impressed with what they were seeing starting to happen in the shelter with the dogs that we were um, using for the study, that they actually approached us and asked if we had any extra treat buckets available, uh, because they wanted to start the same exercise with some other dogs in other areas of the shelter, such as those that were in their medical area or those on their bike quarantines. Uh, so that was actually quite interesting to see. And yes, we did have extras and we did uh, get them some buckets. Uh, in these two graphs, uh, these are some of our descriptive statistics. And what we're looking at here on the left is um, the comparison of the highest decibel reading um, on the day of the study. And so the one on the left, as I said, max decibel, and this is just for that day. And the dotted um, line um, splits in the graph in half left to right 
is uh, actually the left part is intervention and the right part is, or the left part, I'm sorry, is our baseline. The right is intervention. And so you can see initially, uh, we were still pretty high, 103 decibels, but um, when we started to switch over, we got up to about 106. As you can imagine, being anywhere from 103 to 106 decibels isn't really statistically significant throughout the study. Um, however, it's a little interesting that it got higher as the shelter got fuller um, as summer progressed. On the graph on the right, we actually compared the different time points. So we had um, morning, which was a blue line, uh, midday, which was the green line, and the evening measurement or the late afternoon measurement, which is the bottom orange line. And we did this because one of the trends that we found when we did the uh, initial pilot study was that the dogs were actually much louder in the morning and were quieter throughout the day uh, until it was time for them to go home. And that, that makes sense if you think about it, you know, people coming in and we're anticipating things happening, feeding, walking, etc. cetera. Um, where is this more population in the shelter uh, in the evenings when uh, folks are coming through? So, and this one, this is where we went back and looked at um, compliance. Does the amount of people who are participating, does that make a difference? And so we looked at compliance and how that changed over time. And this was really cool, too, because this actually followed the same pattern that we saw in the pilot study as well. As, as the study progressed, compliance overall started to increase. And we hypothesized that the pilot study, because it was generally the same people coming through, owners and staff members who worked in the health and wellness center, that they were seeing differences. And so they were saying, oh, I guess this works. Yes, I do want to participate. But in this case, knowing that the majority of the uh, participants were members of the public, we don't really have as good of an explanation as to why the compliance rate went up over time. Uh, but I do think it's interesting because this actually does imp uh, impact some of our other results. And a fun fact uh, that Jamie noticed while she was in the shelter was that uh, the kids are actually more likely to give the treats than the adults. And they start to give the treats and then they encourage the adults to give the treats. And then more people in the ward at that time start to give treats as well. So that was very adorable. Um, and also I think you know, important thing to note when we're thinking about how we want to set this up. All right, and so here's a bunch of really complicated numbers, which is where our statistical team comes in place to help us out. But really what we're looking at here uh, is we're looking at those two comparisons that we did. Is it the intervention versus our baseline and giving treats versus not giving treats? Or is it the number of people participating versus those um, the volume? And so long story short, what you can see here is we get our negative number, which is our significant one, is our negative point or negative 17.286. And this is with the compliance rate. And if you look at our p-value, you also see that this is um, significant. So what this means, this linear mixed model, it means it's not necessarily the time, the amount of time that the study was in place that was important for the volume change. What was important was whether or not people were participating. So for every percent increase in compliance rates, there was an average decrease in 17.3 decibels in the maximum decibel reading during that time period. And so to put this into context a little bit, think about um, OSHA requirements for hearing protection at 85 decibels. Whereas normal conversation volume is 65 to 70 decibels. So this is a really monumentally clinically impactful volume difference with simply having more people participating in the exercise. So that was really cool to see and also something we were not expecting. And now I want to turn it over to Jami and she's going to talk to you a little bit about Malcolm. Yeah, so Malcolm here was uh, this dog that was uh, in the shelter when we started to set up and it was there until the end. Sadly, he did not get adopted while we were there. Um, but when we first met him, this I'm going to show you a clip of him when we first met him and how his kind of body language was. <laughs> So um, as you can see, his body language is very tense. He would get like this immediately when someone would enter the 
the room is it wasn't even like approaching him directly he would get like very defensive like you can see he's uh, right there in front of the kennel like defending sort of his space he doesn't want anyone to get near him um and sort of like we were interested in seeing him like that from the start so we st we recorded him on um, during the our baseline period and then we wanted to observe how he progressed throughout the study and here we have a video of him on day 16 on the intervention period So as you can see, we were now able to get inside the room and closer to his kennel and he would be laying down. He's still showing some signs of anxiety, sort of like the snout leaking and he's not completely relaxed. He's aware that you're there and he kept an eye on the visitors. But um, overall, his body language has changed a lot. We were By the end of the study, I was able to get like really close to the kennel without him barking. And we also saw this like um, with the visitors that would come in. It was not only me, he was doing it with everybody. He would kind of stare now at people waiting for the tweets and staring at the bucket like, hey, give me something. So it was very, very rewarding to see that with him. Yeah. So in conclusion, uh, we determined that the quiet, quiet kennel exercise works. Um, there was an overall noise level reduction at the shelter, as we saw with the statistics, and the increase in visitors came with an increase in compliance. Um, for whatever reason, as more people would come into the shelter, they were more likely to participate and to give treats to the dogs. And we determined that compliance is the key to the noise level reduction. It doesn't matter for how long we'd implemented. If people are not participating, we will not get the same results. And so what does it mean for compliance to be the key? It means that we, if we're going to apply this in shelters, we must focus our energy into encouraging visitors to participate. And how can we do this? Um, we were thinking about uh, bettering the, the signage and like making it more diverse, uh, including different languages so that everyone can understand what we're asking and, and actually participate. We can increase the quantity, we can make them more clear and more like, um, more like in your face at signs that you need to participate in every in every kennel. We, we should also make the staff aware of the dynamic of what we're doing so that if visitors have questions, they can ask them and they will be able to sort of like instruct them on what to do. The quantity of visitors should be increased in the shelters that want to implement this. Um, it was um, it's key that they that the visitors are the ones who are participating the most and also helps the staff not have not have that responsibility of the, on them. And also the availability of treats, we must make sure that the buckets are ready, that they're clean, that they have treats all the time so that people can actually participate. And so this shelter was very special. They had uh, different methods of enrichment and they were trying to mitigate sound before we even showed up. So they had um, a wonderful team of volunteers that would show up every day, two times a day to walk all the dogs, even on weekends. They also played classical music in the mornings, like a very low conversational level sound. Um, they give lots of enrichment with toys and long lasting treats such as frozen peanut butter cones. And we believe that the combination of everything is what really helped our project be successful and that it should really be looked into when applying it into different shelters. All these interventions were in place during the baseline as well as the intervention mm -hmm. period. Um, so this was, you know, our study was just one additional thing that we added to what they were already doing. Yeah. And so as we saw with Malcolm, I also noticed additional benefits that this project had in the different dogs that were there. Um, we saw a decrease in fear and anxiety and distress in the dogs. Their body language sort of had changed. They were much more relaxed. They showed very... Uh, huge interest in potential adopters because they were expecting the treats and they would come on their own to the front of the kennel. Um, it increased and also increased the opportunity for adopters to interact with the dogs in a positive manner because before, if you have nothing to do with the dog and you're trying to get their attention, they would just bang on the kennel, they would put their fingers inside the kennel, which can lead to other things. So um, it, it gave us a huge opportunity for, for that interaction to be positive and we believe that it could help adoptions in the future. Um, we also, uh, the quiet kennel exercise could also be used to increase the number of visitors in the shelters. We believe that um, with social media and everything that's going on now, um, it is a great way to promote it and be like, hey, come give treats to our dogs. They really need it. They would help, it would help them like feel better about being on the shelter and about meeting other people. And there was also a boost in the staff morale. As Dr. Bennett said, the, the staff members were excited about the project. They were asking me questions about it. They were asking for more buckets for other dogs. 
So overall, it was um, a huge change in the uh, sort of like the environment and the anxiety that barking produces. We were like feeling like we could do something for the dogs. And so as we know that um, some shelters uh, don't have the same uh, funding or the same capability of, of implementing the quiet counter exercise, we were thinking about some ways we could simplify it. For example, we can use kibble instead of treats. And this is a good way for dogs who have sort of food sensitivities or other things to still receive treats and to reduce the cost of the treats. Um, we can also provide visitors with treats beforehand so that they could give them to the dogs as they go through it. This might be better for a smaller shelter because even like more than 100 treats to a person might be overwhelming, but like it's still a good way to like reduce the cost of treats. Um, and also to add the instructions uh, to, the, to the visitors um, in the Wake County Animal Center, they had this little pamphlet that they would give all the visitors with the instructions of what to do if they saw a dog that they like and everything. We can add the instructions there so that they are reminded of what they need to do. And also promote it in social media. As I said before, TikTok is a good way to use this. I see videos about shelters um, and all the amazing things they can do with that. So. And so as with everything, there are some um, limitations that we may face when applying the quiet counter exercise. For shelters that are in a very diverse place, we must be aware of the language of the science and be sure that we include um, all the languages so that people can um, actually know what they have to do and participate. So that could be a challenging for, for the staff to like find the, the way to do that. Um, there's There were also some logistical challenges with the buckets. As we know, dogs are very smart and they quickly found out where the treats were coming from and some of them have more energy than others. So we had to place the buckets higher up and this could be challenging for people to reach them, especially the kids, since they were the ones who were most participating. And I also noticed this was not something that I took um, sort of data on, but I also noticed that the appearance and the age of the dogs might influence how many treats they were getting. As we know, um, and I'm sure that all of you that work in shelters know, some dogs get like more attention than others. The, the puppies, the fluffy dogs, I would have to refill their buckets much more often than other dogs. And so this is important to keep in mind and, and shelter staff might be more intentional about giving treats to some dogs that are not getting as much as others. And also, as with everything, the initial investment of getting the buckets and the treats, uh, if it's not a well-funded shelter, it, it might be a challenge to start with. So I think it's really interesting that Johnny has mentioned um, getting people into the shelters with this. And um, this is a really simple, difficult to screw up exercise because really it doesn't matter what they're doing, just give them a treat. And this can be something that people who aren't, necessarily interested in adopting, but you know, just want to go see the cute dogs or whatever on a Saturday afternoon. This gives them something productive to do. Uh, however, a question that we get uh, with fair frequency with these studies is, aren't we rewarding barking? And I want to uh, address this because remember in the beginning of it, we talked about classical conditioning versus operant conditioning. And so when these two things are happening at the same time, classical conditioning will oftentimes override operant conditioning, they can both occur at the same time, but sometimes we're not in an emotional state where it's easy for us to learn by trial and error learning. That's why it's hard to learn um, algebra if you're anxious at that point in time in class, right? So we start with just changing the way they feel, make them feel a little bit better, take down their intensity of their emotion state a little bit so they can start to use their thinking brain, right? And that's what we're doing when we're simply tossing treats. And the shelters want to take it a step further once they have a dog such as Malcolm, who is no longer running up to the front of the kennel, you know, hackling up, pulling his ears back, giving that big alarm bark, but rather sitting on his bed quietly or standing at the front of the kennel saying, oh, are you going to give me treats? Now you can ask them to do stuff if you want to. If they've been there long enough that it's worth the investment to start teaching them things, if you have staff or volunteers who want to do that, sure, ask them for a sit, ask them for a high five or whatever you think is cute that day. Awesome. But we have to start with the emotional state first, the classical conditioning. And once that has been addressed, then we can move into the opera. So when in doubt, use food. You're not likely to go wrong, especially in a stressful situation such as a shelter. We're more likely to help their emotional state get to a point where they can think on their own uh, rather than rewarded behavior that we don't want. Another question we get is um, concerns about uh, GI problems, vomiting, diarrhea, um, shelter is stressful, what's one of our stress um, organs? The gut. Um, so valid concern. 
Uh, and also weight gain. And so one of the things that we discussed when we set this up is we wanted to look at trees that were high quality, low calorie, and inexpensive. Um, and if that was still going to be a problem, that's where kibble comes in. And you can actually take the amount of treats or kibble that you're putting in the treat bucket or the little baggie that the visitor's kiss at the beginning and calculate that into, you know, what the dogs are getting. So if they get a cup of food twice a day, maybe we get them three quarters of a cup of food each day or twice a day and use that remaining half cup for our intervention. And another one that often comes up too is, aren't visitors at risk for getting bitten when they're getting treats? And as Jamie pointed out, when you're thinking about the visitors and customers wanting to interact with the dogs, regardless of whether this is in place or not, they're gonna to try to get the dog to pay attention to them, right? Banging on the front of the kennel, poking their fingers through, um, doing all sorts of stuff, right? One could argue that perhaps doing things that are antagonistic to a dog who is additionally frightening to an already stressed dog could potentially increase the motivation to feel like they have no option but to use aggression. Whereas if we're giving food and like, oh, oh, I know food is coming. Emotion is different. So less likely to use that um, tactic to try to defend themselves. And the number of dogs who are going to get really nippy with um, taking the treats is actually pretty low, um, surprisingly low. And if there are shelters that are so concerned about that, and that's totally okay, uh, we actually have um, some of our organizations who have set up um, what we affectionately call uh, PVC snorkels. So it's simply just a piece of PVC pipe, and I don't think I got it into this presentation. Um, but there's a spot where the person can put the treats into the, the PVC uh, snorkel on the outside of the kennel, and it pops through uh, into the dog's kennel on its own without fingers being anywhere near the dog. So just want to think about what height you're putting your snorkel so that your uh, smaller statured people and your kids can also access that. So lots of different ways that we can try to mitigate uh, some of the risks and um, common questions that we get about this. And so in conclusion, we want to um, mention again that we did find statistically significant and clinically significant association with an increase in compliance paired with a uh, decrease in our maximum noise volume. So remind you, 1% increase in compliance gave us a 17.3 decrease in our decibels. This therefore supposes our hypothesis uh, and helps us conclude that the quiet kennel exercise is in fact effective at reducing barking in sheltered dogs. And of course, efficacy is going to depend on the amount of people who are participating. We would like to thank the Wake County Animal Center's staff and volunteers for generously allowing us into our facility to do this. Uh, the rest of the behavior medicine team here at NC State, um, we function as a cohesive team and they were also very invaluable with uh, brainstorming and helping us when we got um, snagged. The statistical analysis team at NC State uh, absolutely were helpful with um, our numbers. The veterinary scholars program, the Fear Free Research and Grant, and the NC State Floral Science Endowment were the um, funding sources that helped um, get Jami the opportunity uh, to work with us for the summer for our research and also help to uh, fund our supplies um, and analysis for this project. And lastly, we want to thank Maddie's, uh, Maddie's Insights by Maddie's Fund for uh, asking us to do this webinar for you today. Thank you very much for your time. So thank you have our emails here. And of course, Maddie's Forum is a place to get uh, questions that we don't get you answered. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Jimmy and Dr. Bennett. I'm going to ask you to give just a couple more seconds for people to get your email addresses if mm -hmm. they need them. Then if you could stop screen sharing so we can start with the Q&A section. Sounds good. Our first question is, do you give a treat every time you enter the kennel area or every time you pass each dog's kennel? We were encouraging every time they pass uh, the kennel was like every time they would go through a dog, they had the bucket there and they could um, give the treats. Although it would be ideal that every time someone comes in the room, they can go ahead and give a treat to the dog. This would be ideal for our visitors, but we know that staff members, it's hard to like, every time I'm gonna cross this room, I gotta give a treat to every dog that I see. 
it might take a lot of time. So that's why we were mostly um, encouraging visitors to do it because they're either way they're going to go visit each dog. Next question is, were the treat buckets with kibble pieces given for other reasons after the study ended? We actually left the treat buckets that we uh, used for the study with the shelter so that they could continue this project uh, after we left. So they are at the discretion if they want to use those treats for other behaviors they want to reinforce. Um, that is certainly at their discretion to be able to do. Uh, but our main goal was to simply just, just give the dog treats. Uh, I don't care what they're doing. Um, if you want to wait to ask them to do something, that's fine. But let's at least get them treats when you come by. Next question is, if dogs have access to the indoor area and their outdoor run, would you provide them treats on just one side or would it be more beneficial to give them treats both inside and out? I guess it depends where the visitors can access them because our main goal was for them to associate the people with treats. So if the people are going only inside of, in the area inside, then it would be ideal for them to think, oh, I only get treats when people come by because then they associate the people with something good. Um, but definitely if, if the visitors have access to the outdoor area and they want to give treats, that would also be great. I bet in the shelter that was set up like that, they had indoor and outdoor access. So people could walk by either side for the dogs. And one of the ways that they addressed that, rather than having to have double the number of buckets, they actually had little baggies of treats that they would have people pick up on their way in and they could hand those out as they walked wherever they were in the shelter. All right. And it looks like that is our last question, unless there are any other questions being entered into Q&A right now. And while we're waiting to see if there's any new ones um, there, Ana Lucia Baldan shared um, her 2023 research looking at reducing barking in a Brazilian animal shelter, a practical intervention. And the link to that is shared in the chat. So it looks like she's done some similar work. So great to be seeing more research in this area. And especially because one research project is one study at one place. And the more research we have on a sim similar topic, we can then more be more confident in generalizing those results. Would you all agree? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. That's very exciting. I can't wait to look at that. All right. It looks like we don't have any more questions, so we'll close things out today. When you leave this webcast, you'll be taken to a brief survey where we hope you'll take just a minute to answer a few questions to help us plan future Maddie's Insights webcasts. Thank you, Jamie and Dr. Bennett. And Thank you, guys. Thanks to all of you for watching today's webcast. Both Dr. Bennett and Jamie will be available on Maddie's pet forum to continue this discussion. Feel free to post more questions there. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye.